Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Now, although they have announced that uh, version 0.19 of Kerbal Space Program will not contain the resource harvesting features they previously announced, people are still discussing that resource chart. Specifically, they're uh, arguing over the pros and the cons of the naming scheme, with some people liking the generic resource names and others wanting to go full tilt with realism in a game about little green men. So, quietly ignoring the merits of the debate, I thought it would be nice to do a little introduction to the armchair space scientists out there who have perhaps asked on occasion, what is rocket fuel anyway? Well, at its most basic, all rocket fuels are reaction mass. That is, they harness the power of Newton's second law to accelerate the spacecraft. All rocket engines work on the principle of applying force to a mass in one direction, so that the equal and opposite force is applied in the other direction. I.e., we throw mass out in one direction at high speeds, and the reaction applies a force in the opposite direction. <laughs> This force results in an acceleration of the spacecraft. Most rockets impart this velocity by simply letting uh, the exhaust gases expand thermally through a rocket nozzle. And the specific impulse or efficiency of a fuel depends on the properties of the exhaust. The specific impulse is uh, basically a measure of how efficient your rockets are. The higher it is, the better your rockets are. And it's directly related to the velocity of the molecules in the gas heading out the back of your rocket. Which means that we can apply basic physics and we realise that the rocket thrust depends on the temperature of the gas and on its molecular mass. Specifically, the specific impulse <laughs> is proportional to the square root of the temperature and inversely proportional to the molecular mass of the gas. So you want the exhaust gases to be as hot as possible and made of the lightest possible molecules. Now the most basic kind of rocket is a compressed gas jet, like those found in NASA's manned maneuvering unit, uh, the backpacks, right? This is just basically a, a pressurized nitrogen uh, in a cylinder that when they turned a valve and released it, it created a small thrust uh, for the astronaut using the device. It's nice, it's simple, it's safe. There's no combustion, no chemical reactions. It's boring, but it's reliable. And it's just the kind of thing you want on a wearable propulsion system. See, I bet some of you thought that rocket fuel was all about explosions and, uh, and everything, but it, it's more mundane than that. Of course, for most things we think of rock as rockets, there's a secondary function to the fuel, and that is to undergo some chemical reaction that releases energy, increasing the temperature and thus getting higher impulse for the same mass of input fuel. In Kerbal Space Program, the standard rockets are fueled by a combination of generic liquid fuel and oxidizer. And that's mostly in the same ballpark as reality, but reality blesses us with a plethora of fuel mixtures that offer a variety of pros and cons to fit your rocketry requirements. Perhaps the best known rocket fuel is a combination of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. This is what powers the Space Shuttle's main engines, and it's also currently used in the Ariane 5 and the Delta IV, and it's also found in the Centaur upper stages used by uh, all rockets, pretty much, uh, all American rockets. Um, li liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen has many great properties. Uh, it's highly energetic, and the combustion product, water, is light, so the exhaust velocity is very high, and therefore the mixture provides the highest specific impulse of any commonly used rocket fuel. It's also very clean, with the combustion products being like totally non-toxic. And the fuel itself also tends to evaporate away instead of polluting on the launch site. But... That evaporation process is a problem. You can't fuel your rocket until just before launch, and on extended missions it will evaporate away over time. Also, you need to keep your fuel tanks cold to minimise this fuel loss, which leads to other technical considerations. I mean, in the case of the Columbia disaster, the piece of foam that broke off the external tank was there to, you know, to stop the fuel evaporating. Um, and so that 
technical problem uh, was ultimately caused by the fuel requirements. Anyway, another thing to consider is that hydrogen is very low density, specifically liquid hydrogen. Um, it's so it's so low density apparently that if you try to float a marshmallow in it, it would sink, right? Because it's so low density, you need very large tanks, and of course that means more engineering problems. If you look at the Space Shuttle's external tank, that large external tank, something like 80% of the size is liquid hydrogen and 20% is liquid oxygen. So because of this large uh, difference in fuel densities, the Space Shuttle tank has to be very large. Now, to get around this problem, the, and there's another common propellant mixture. It still uses liquid oxygen, but instead they react it with something called RP1, which is essentially a highly refined version of kerosene. They remove things like sulfur, which has a tendency to make the fuel turn into a gunk that uh, blocks up fuel to pipes, which is a big problem when you're trying to pump tons of fuel per second through uh, these engines. Now, uh, liquid oxygen RP1 rockets aren't as efficient as liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, but they're close enough that it's used because the advantages of the fuel outweigh this drawback. Firstly, kerosene is liquid at room temperature, and it's much denser, so the fuel tanks end up being a lot simpler and smaller. Also, because the density is close enough to that of liquid oxygen, there are engines that simplify the turbo pump by using a single drive shaft to drive the pumps that pump the rocket fuel and the oxidizer because the densities are close enough that they don't need to worry about uh, different densities and uh, that you know having simple simpler components obviously makes for a safer and, and better rocket I mean rockets that use uh, liquid oxygen and RP1 or kerosene are everywhere. There's the Saturn V, which took men to the moon. There's the Atlas, the Soyuz, and the Falcon that is launched by SpaceX. They are all using this fuel mixture. Okay, so the next most common propellant mixtures do away with the liquid oxygen. And as I already pointed out, liquid oxygen poses engineering problems because it's cryogenic. But its use also complicates engine design because liquid oxygen doesn't spontaneously combust when mixed with either hydrogen or kerosene or any other common fuel for that matter. So engines which use these fuel mixtures, they need to include extra hardware to ignite the rocket. And that means adding complexity and of course one more thing to fail. Nitrogen tetroxide is the favoured replacement for liquid oxygen and there are a variety of fuel types which this works well with. All with cool names like hydrazine, monomethyl hydrazine, and my favourite, unsymmetric dimethyl hydrazine, which thankfully gets abbreviated to UDMH. When you mix these fuels together, they spontaneously combust. Fuels which spontaneously react are described as hypergolic fuels, and they're actually very useful for things like reaction control thrusters that need to be very small, simple, and reliable. Furthermore, both fuels are liquid at room temperature, so they don't evaporate over time. Or at least if they do, they don't evaporate as quickly as cryogenic fuels. This is hugely important for space probes that might need to have, you know, they might need to travel for months or even years between engine burns. Originally, the room temperature liquid fuel mix was developed for use on uh, nuclear missiles, so that the missiles could remain fueled in their silos um, but technology has moved on and, and nuclear missiles switched over to using solid rockets instead, which were even more convenient. Now, while you lose a bit of specific impulse by going with these fuels, the engineering benefits of the fuel mixtures mean that they're used everywhere. Um, but the hypergolic property of fuel does come with a cost. You see, these the chemicals they use are highly reactive. And that makes them want to react with all sorts of things that you don't want them to react with. In particular, they're generally highly toxic, and so are, and sometimes so are their combustion products. And famously, on the Apollo-Soyuz mission, when the Apollo capsule was returning to planet Earth, 
There was a venting problem which resulted in fuel and uh, exhaust gases leaking into the cabin's oxygen supply and that uh, sent, knocked out one of the astronauts and uh, hospitalized all three of them. So it's nasty stuff you want to keep away from uh, things like people. Now, going a step beyond that, there was a famous case where they used uh, UDMH and nitric acid and dinitrogen tetroxide in a fuel mixture. And this was so toxic that the engineers who worked with it called it the devil's venom. Uh, this was a, a Russian fuel mixture that was used to, do, to fuel their first uh, nuclear missile, their first ICBM, the R-16. Uh, on, during development, it exploded on the launch pad and killed over 100 people, including the commanding officer of the Soviet missile forces. Um, and, you know, the fuel mixture was so toxic and so corrosive that while they originally intended it to be a storable propellant so they could leave the fuel in the, the tanks, they realized that after four days the nitric acid had irreversibly damaged the fuel tanks and so they would have to drain the fuel from the tanks and send the missiles back to the factory to get refurbished. It really wasn't the greatest stuff, but it does find uses, believe it or not. Anyway, all these mixtures of two chemicals, right, are collectively referred to as bipropellants because essentially they require two components to be mixed together for the reaction to occur. But for extra simplicity, there actually exists something called monopropellants, and as the name suggests, this consists of only one chemical. Now, some chemicals are unstable enough that they can break down into more stable products and release energy in the process. Usually this is done by passing the fuel over a heated catalyst, and as, as it happens, uh, common monopropellants are frequently used as part of a bipropellant mixture. Hydrogen, hydrazine and hydrogen peroxide are both excellent examples. In fact, the German rocket planes used in World War II, they mixed hydrazine and hydrogen peroxide, as well as alcohol, in their fuel mixture. Anyway, when you force hydrazine to break down, it forms hydrogen, nitrogen, and ammonia, and releases energy. And the specific impulse of this rocket mixture is lower than any reasonable bipropellant, but its simplicity, the simplicity of the design really makes up for it in some applications. Similarly, hydrogen peroxide breaks down into oxygen and water, and some space mission designers use this concept as a common supply for oxygen, water, and life support, for life support. But these advantages have to be weighed against the fact that it has an even lower specific impulse than uh, hydrazine. Anyway, so those are monopropellants, very simple. Now, why, they are less efficient than bipropellants, so I might hear some of you out there asking, can we do better with a tripropellant mixing three fuel types together? I mean, just say you are a rocket designer who wants the most powerful rocket fuel you can get. Just say that you're happy to deal with what it, with the fuels that are averse to room temperature and don't care how toxic, corrosive, or downright nasty the fuel or exhaust products are. In that case, there is a fuel mixture for you. Theoretically, you can fuel a rocket with fluorine, lithium, and hydrogen. This is a tripropellant, which produces a specific impulse which is 20% higher than the relatively mundane hydrogen-oxygen mixture we started this discussion with. But to keep everything liquid is a challenge. The hydrogen requires chilling to about minus 250 degrees centigrade, and the lithium needs to be heated above about 200 degrees centigrade. And in addition to the fuel and exhaust being horrifically toxic, it's so hot that it's ionized and will interfere with your electronics. But anyway, that's a bit off the theoretical deep end. Anyway, let's move on. We should probably mention solid boosters, even though they're not pro probably the first thing that comes to mind when you're presented with the phrase rocket fuel. But we'll cover it nevertheless. Your typical solid rocket motor consists of granular oxidizer mixed with granular fuel and some sort of binding agent that, uh, that's liquid during manufacture and then sets after it's poured into the mold. Uh, for the shuttle solid rocket boosters, the fuel mixture, I believe, was ammonium percolate and powdered aluminium with a plastic binder that gave the fuel a consistency somewhat like hard rubber. And once lit, this burns quite energetically. 
And uh, there's also uh, something called a hybrid rocket design, which is like a solid rocket motor, but with only the fuel granules in. Instead, they have a channel down the middle, uh, basically a pipe, and you pump the oxidizer down there and light it. With a hybrid motor, you can throttle the oxidizer flow up and down. You can get some control over the thrust of the rocket. Spaceship One used nitrous oxide for this purpose, which you'll know as laughing gas. So I think that's covered all the fuel types that use chemical reactions, which is of course the vast majority of fuel used in space applications, but I should probably finish up by coming back to non-chemical rockets once more. In nuclear and electrical propulsion systems, the fuel is purely a reaction mass. The energy to accelerate it does not come from the fuel itself. And by taking this approach, you can exceed the specific impulse of any chemical rocket that would otherwise be constrained by the limits of mere chemistry. However, there are still important considerations to be taken into account when choosing these fuels. With nuclear engine, the fuel is passed through a reactor core and heated by the fission reaction. Now, the efficiency of this rocket depends on generating as much power as possible while keeping the reactor core cool enough that it doesn't destroy itself. In fact, the most powerful controlled nuclear reaction ever run was part of a test of a nuclear engine. Now, interestingly enough, the exhaust from a nuclear engine is actually cooler than the exhaust from a chemical engine. See, the exhaust from the space shuttle main engine is hot enough to boil iron and... Uh, to stop the heat of the reaction destroying the engine, the engineers actually had to run the incoming cryogenic fuel around the structure of the space shuttle main engines to keep it cool enough to keep working. But in a nuclear rocket, the heat transfer is running in the opposite direction from the structure into the fuel. So the core needs to be as hot as possible. And because of the laws of thermodynamics, the exhaust can't be any hotter than this. So in, since the temperature of the exhaust is lower, you need to use a lighter fuel, a lighter molecular mass, to get the higher exhaust velocity, which makes liquid hydrogen your fuel of choice. Despite the fact that the exhaust is cooler, the fact that the molecular mass of hydrogen molecules is one-ninth of the molecular mass of a water molecule more than makes up for the difference and gets you a specific impulse which is twice that of a typical uh, hydrogen oxygen rocket. Now uh, moving on to electrical thrusters, there are quite a few variations of electrical thrusters which use electromagnetic forces to accelerate ions up to high velocities. Now for these applications the fuel is simply a reaction mass to push against with the electric fields. And to maximize the lifetime of these engines, the fuels are chosen to be as inert as possible, so that the ions being used don't react with the engine and damage it. In the early days of electrical thruster development, they uh, tried to use mercury and cesium, but uh, these actually tended to destroy the engines over time. And uh, xenon has since become the propellant of choice for all electrical engines. Now, xenon is the heaviest stable noble gas in the periodic table. And as such, it has the highest boiling point. And it also requires the least amount of energy to ionize. So there are many reasons for its use. However, it is incredibly rare. I mean... Typically, it comes from liquid oxygen and liquid nitrogen creating, where you basically take the atmosphere and you cool it, liquefy it, and fractionate it. And if you take 1,000 tons of the Earth's atmosphere and you liquefy it, you'll get roughly 800 tons of nitrogen, 200 tons of oxygen, and about 1 kilogram or 2 pounds of xenon. So it's horribly rare stuff and actually quite valuable pound for pound. So there are people trying to develop electrical engines that work better on things like Krypton and Argon. Well, anyway, I think that covers anything. I hope you've enjoyed this little overview. You might have learned something, or you might have just had some reason to criticize me now for skipping over something really important. Regardless, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.